So, hello guys. I think it's 11 o'clock, so we can actually start. Uh, my name is Jonas Jovicius. I'm a customer success manager here at Cloudvisor. Uh, and I will be hosting today this webinar, uh, which will be on the reInvent 2021 recap. Uh, so before we start, there are some <laughs> a few things to mention. So the first one is your questions are very welcome. Uh, please submit them in the Q&A section that you see in the Zoom, or as well, you can put them in the chat. Uh, we'll go through them during the main session uh, or after the presentation is over. Uh, and another thing is that this uh, presentation is being recorded and we will share the recording with you all uh, tomorrow. So let us uh, begin. And uh, together, together with me today is Tunis Tilakas, the solutions architect at AWS. Tunis, uh, would you say hi to our guests? Hey everyone, good to be here. Uh, glad to see already so many people joining. Um, yeah, as uh, as Jonas mentioned, I'm, I'm a solutions architect at AWS. I work with our customers in the Baltics, uh, mostly, uh, uh, well, pretty much across the board. Uh, any kind of customer uh, we would have, I I usually have something something to do with them. So glad to see you all, and uh, great to meet you also in the uh, uh, Slack group. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Uh, you will be able to share the Slack room later. <laughs> I think it, it's important and interesting. Uh, and together uh, as well, we have the uh, Yulis Gregorowskis, uh, our Cloudvisor CEO. Yulis, say hi. Hello, uh, Looking forward to a very interesting discussion today. Yeah, so we'll have a, a panel today. Uh, and so we're going to cover all the hottest news from AWS reInvents uh, and more and some stuff that happened even pre in event. So I'm very happy to have them uh, with me and let's uh, move to the introduction about the Cloudvisor. So we are an uh, advanced tier AWS partner operating mainly in the Baltics and Nordics and we work closely with AWS to support our current users. Uh, and it's important to mention that the majority of our customers are startups. So we are basically very familiar with the ins and outs of their uh, operations. And we can uh, help you to build your AWS infrastructure and help you scale efficiently. Uh, our main business line is AWS Resell, uh, which is being used by a number of companies. And it means you can get an immediate discount on what you already spend on AWS. And then you can keep that extra cash to yourself, donate to the non-governmental organization through Cloudvisor, uh, or even get some DevOps hours for your spend. Uh, the newest thing that we offer is the Observe plan, uh, where you can get the top-notch dashboards uh, configured by our experts that would help you monitor your infrastructure 24-7. Uh, if that sounds attractive to you, uh, please reach out to us and we will tell you more. So uh, I think we can go to our agenda for today. Uh, so we will basically cover the pre-invent announcements that were uh, released just before the re-invent, uh, but are what's worth mentioning. Um, and then we will jump in into the re-invent announcements themselves. And after that, we'll have a Q&A session. So feel free to post your questions uh, we'll uh, we'll have a look at them at the end of the presentation. Nice, let's do this. Uh, so uh, first things first, these uh, there are several uh, major announcements uh, that were uh, covered before reInvent, right? So uh, the first thing that we would like to talk about, because we have a uh, among our audience, uh, there are several developers at least. So I think what's important to cover is that AWS app config feature flags uh, uh, has been announced, uh, which basically helps our developers to uh, deploy the code and change it after it's deployed without redeploying. So what do you think to this? What what this changes to what, what this changes to our uh, developers? Yeah, thanks, Jonas. Um, I, I think I think you already mentioned the very important point there that uh, 
look everywhere we go like we want to see we want to see separation of concerns right we um when when we build services and when we recommend something to be built we we think of uh for example separating storage and compute uh because this helps you move faster and i think on the development side as well um so uh the ability to kind of separate delivery of code and the actual enablement or sort of uh, switching something on, switching something off in, a, in an environment uh, uh, that really helps you immensely. And um, while the app config feature flags are currently in preview, there um, there's something that have been uh, fairly well battle tested inside Amazon as well. So uh, we use uh, these features and similar kinds of features throughout the whole chain. So thousands of teams inside Amazon are using it already that's like the best practice that you guys developed and then moved it over to our customers right exactly exactly this is uh, this is definitely one of the things we want to have so amazon.com for example is a really good customer of ours and <laughs> uh, we try to we try to push as much as possible uh uh kind of the feedback let's say that we get from our customers anyway um to actual services mm -hmm. Also, I would like to mention that the feature flags themselves are not just a sim sim uh, simple uh, Boolean values. You can actually provide the uh, data to that feature flag that might be text, numbers, whatever. So it's not like a, a simple piece of feature. <laughs> like you can get very creative with it. Yeah, precisely, and uh, and it, you know it, you can you can really think about it more as a dynamic configuration option, uh, even uh, for yeah. features. Yeah, Yulis, any any words? Yeah, I, like my my personal favorite uh, from from this list is uh, most probably the one who is uh, least uh, uh, related to the technical side of things is the uh, the AWS price reduction for, for data transfers, uh, which uh, actually uh, I don't know why yeah why AWS actually um, called it like that because if you look deeper into it, it's it basically more. Not a price reduction, but uh, an upgrade on the free tier right. that AWS provides uh, to to CloudFront and and data transfer out. And uh, I think like the CloudFront part is, is like the most significant one as the uh, the upgrade from uh, the free tier that we had until now, which was fifty gigs uh, per month, and only for the first uh, twelve uh, months, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. So now it's like perpetual and it's uh, one terabyte uh, each month, which, you know, in my, in my opinion, should uh, really uh, encourage a lot of uh, customers to start using CloudFront, which was, uh, well, I would say, frankly, quite neglected for some reason or the other, though it's like a very, a very good uh, service. And at the same time, you know, you're basically with no additional costs or like very, very little additional costs, you can... Uh, not only make your app run faster, but also make it way more secure in that way. So hopefully that will uh, change a lot. And as the West themselves say that this announcement, this change will make uh, like the data transfer outline uh, be zero from now on to million, millions of their customers. So quite, um, quite a big change, I would say. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we, we, we were we were quite uh, quite a bit on making our network uh, especially kind of age networks uh, more more efficient and and really want to kind of get this uh, uh, get this sort of uh, scale uh, saving savings from scale uh, scale back to our customers and I think this is one good example yeah and, and to throw in some numbers there is uh, from the December 1st uh, uh, AWS provides a, a 100 gigs of data out and a terabyte, a terabyte uh, for the CloudFront traffic. And as well, they're throwing 2 million CloudFront functions as well for the free tier. So uh, as AWS says uh, themselves, uh, uh, millions of customers will just see a zero line at their data transfer, uh, <laughs> data transfer costs. <laughs> so that's a great news for yeah, I would, I would even, I would even, I would even correct that a bit. Uh, so from CloudFront out, it's it's a terabyte per month, and and yeah. a general easy to data out from a region is a 100 gigabytes. Yes. So so definitely use CloudFront if you can. <laughs> you have more of that. Yeah, and briefly, I think we can also uh, cover the uh, Fargate update that uh, now includes the ARM-based Graviton to uh, compute. Uh, so basically, you can now run your uh, your containers on the Graviton2 instances, and therefore 
get better price and performance uh, from the for, for your uh, workloads. So uh, I think uh, this is a major upgrade because it brings like 30, 40 percent better better price performance and uh, yeah, it's the way to go. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, I um, think, yeah, go ahead, Yulis. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we will hear uh, Graviton too mention like uh, more today as, as well. And uh, I really like that, you know, AWS is um, really doing a lot of work to, to put this uh, uh, like as, a, as part of a lot of services, that especially like, you know, such popular ones as, as, as Fargate. And uh, at least from the few cases we had here in the Baltics from, from our customers or like uh, the ones that we know that are using AWS quite, you know, uh, quite a lot. So uh, it's really a, a deal breaker in terms of not only performance, but also in terms of, of pricing as well. So like, I, I would like to see even more of Graviton, uh, you know, included in, in the our services because Think that makes a very big, uh, a very big difference, in, in, especially in the managed services. Yeah, definitely. And you know, whenever we have, uh, whenever we have discussions with customers, I mean, uh, while while everybody's going to the cloud mainly for the kind of agility reasons and elasticity, the the first the first talking point is always cost and. Uh, I think cost optimization, but not only that, but also kind of your ability to uh, contribute to better sustainability and, uh, you know, essentially uh, also some additional security features that you get from Graviton, like uh, uh, like always on memory encryption or uh, things like uh, uh, you're not working in hyper threads, but you're actually getting full CPU cores for yourself. Uh, that helps quite a bit in, in many cases and, and is one of the contributing factors to the uh, uh, better price performance as well. Yeah, so so also one thing to men one thing uh, that Tony has mentioned is that sustainability. So uh, ARM cores are basically more power efficient than the x86 cores. So you're not only paying less, getting more performance, but also contributing less to the to the environmental damage. So uh, and and why I think the main main point why is Graviton two is cheaper I guess it's because they use less electricity is that right <laughs> that is that is one really good point as well yeah we uh, we can definitely fit more of them into one rack uh, if we if we need to uh, mainly for the uh, better power consumption um, um, for sure yes yeah okay guys so let's uh, let's move to the uh, actually actual reinvent. And we can start uh, from the serverless and database topics. Uh, there is a bunch of them this year, and uh, they're more or less uh, bundling the same idea uh, to different services. So this year, Amazon just uh, provided us with a load of serverless options for databases, including EMR, Elastic MapReduce, Redshift, uh, MSK for Kafka, and even Kinesis data streams on demand. So um, before, uh, our clients had to create clusters from uh, instances uh, to, utilize these, uh, to, to utilize these services. Now we have like a several, click, several click options to launch the serverless variants of these services and do whatever they do. With the rep sheets, you can have a data warehouse. With the EMR, you can have uh, different uh, uh, petabyte scale data analytics in the cloud. It's just so much more uh, accessible, right, Tonis? Uh, definitely. I mean, accessibility and kind of the ability to kind of launch quickly, uh, experiment quickly, that and you know, essentially have a shorter turnover. That's uh, that's really important for customers. Uh, uh, but also also scalability in a sense that. Uh, uh, you are better able to uh, handle your sporadic workloads. So yeah. if you if you have if you have a baseline performance on you know you have your baseline works always running and you can very well uh, predict what exactly and how much are you going to consume, then serverless you know probably won't give you the cost benefit. But if you have sporadic workloads, like uh, let's say you want to run a development cluster with EMR. Um, yeah. 
that's 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 really easy to start with serverless. Uh, there are there are some initial limitations to these uh, in terms of you know how big you can scale, maybe in terms of storage or throughput initially. But uh, but as more of these services are coming uh, generally available, um, we'll uh, we'll relax those requirements as well and uh, and make sure to give you the best serverless experience. Uh, yeah, and one support. point to add, I, I would add that. Uh, it also uh, reduces the entry barrier to these services as well, because in order to have a uh, proper Redshift cluster, you would have to shell out several hundred dollars a month. Uh, and now you can actually spin uh, the your small projects, uh, small data warehouses. They're they're now uh, possible to do <laughs> with the with the proper AWS services, right? Yeah, that's right. And and uh, with Redshift, I mean, we've been building uh, we've been, we've been bu building on the success of the RA three platform and the Redshift managed storage with that. So uh, so this is one of the cases where we again try to separate compute from storage and give you the kind of the best flexibility this way. Yeah, Julius, any thoughts? Yeah, um, like. <laughs> You know, this is like something that I was looking forward, like these announcements were something that I was looking forward like for quite a long time because like serverless is a big thing. And uh, um, I, even though it's it's quite widely used in the compute, like the usual uh, uh, workloads, but uh, the it's still like one of the core features here is, you know, if you have like uh, spiky workloads, when you know they come and go every every time every you now and so so like uh, everything connected connected to data especially analytics like those are like perfect workloads for serverless because usually they are not you know uh, the data comes like every every now and then you need to work on it and then the, you know your 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 database needs to sit more or less idle and. Uh, um, like all the data pipelines uh, that I saw being built like from the scratch, you know, all of them had in mind like the idea of like being, uh, you know, building uh, as much of serverless uh, pieces there as, as possible and make it like uh, more automated. And, you know, now we have the all of, like majority of that are just out of the box. And as, as, as Tunis uh, mentioned correctly that, you know, uh, with some time in the future, you know, more, you know, there will be less and less limitations and uh, hopefully it will be like very widely used among the customers. I, even now I, I feel some uh, excitement from their side uh, right away from uh, after it was announced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to stress the last thing I would, I would say it's like uh, so far easier startup, like set, setting this up. So it's, it, I think it's one of the main points that you have to take, take it off it from here so good uh let's move back or to, along with the databases so uh the newly uh, announced tier for dynamo db it's called standard in frequent access it's something similar that uh, we have with s3 and uh, basically this uh, offers up to 60 percent uh lower storage costs for your data in dynamo db uh, as well, 20% higher cost for data throughput. But uh, if you have some quite uh, infrequently used data, uh, something like social media posts, uh, transactions history, uh, this data is, is very suitable for such an application. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a, it's, it was long awaited update to DynamoDB. Because uh, up until now, we just simply had a single tier. And we know that our customers have different requirements for different types of data. Yeah, what do you guys think? Mm, you know, from my side, like uh, the, the part that uh, this is something that might save up to 60% of, of uh, your current cost if you're, you have uh, tables that store infrequently access data, like, uh, you know, application logs, uh, all social media posts, um, e-commerce, all their history and like stuff like that. So I think uh, this will definitely find uh, its, its, uh, its user groups among uh, current DynamoDB users. So yeah, one more good example of AWS, uh, you know, doing uh, proactive work to, to redu reduce the, the build, the, the build 
that their customers are getting, even though it sounds like a bit uh, strange, but you know, once you've been, <laughs> been around with AWS for quite some time, you, you don't even uh, get surprised with uh, such announcements that, you know, hey, like, hey, like- You're paying less month, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll be paying less. And, you know, that's, I guess, one of the reasons why they have uh, such a huge uh, customer base. Yeah, exactly. And 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 if you're if you're uh, thinking about you know when when should I really use uh, st- um, standard IA uh, instead of your your regular tables, uh, I, I think uh, I think we've estimated around maybe fifty percent. If if about fifty percent of your costs uh, for a table is storage, so if you're paying about half of your price for a table in in storage, then it's it's a good thing, a good place or a good time to think about that. But uh, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't, um, as, as a solutions architect, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, taking standard and frequent access as a kind of a granted, as a sort default. of a, like, yeah, let's like a default exactly. Uh, that you know, if you if you still have a, a reasonable amount of data that you uh, that you push through DynamoDB and and you really run searches there, you really run lookups there. You, you know, kind of uh, rather want to think about still having those tables as part of the pipeline. So maybe uh, maybe leverage uh, S3 even more and the intelligent tiering in S3 because with DynamoDB, uh, you you, st- you still have to select that for a table. Uh, so so that's kind of a, the granularity that you get uh, with uh, if you're if you're able to structure your data well enough in S3 or in other. Mm-hmm other places, then, uh, then that makes it much easier uh, for you to build the whole pipeline. Right, right. Thanks. Thanks for the insights, Tanis. OK, OK, let's move on. Uh, next, we have the computing section. Uh, we have several announcements. Um, I think the most important here is the Graviton 3. Uh, we mentioned Graviton 2 just, just recently. But Graviton 3 is the new kid on the block. and. Uh, uh, Amazon released the C7G instance. Uh, it's compute based, uh, offers again better price performance and up to, uh, and also it includes a DDR5 memory, which has a 50% more bandwidth. So, and it also will be much more faster in certain, uh, in certain workloads. Uh, Tony, perhaps a quick recap on that. Uh, yeah, sure. So Graviton three. I mean, uh, realistically, yes, it's the it's the next generation. Um, if the f- the first question that I get from uh, customers usually is, uh, should I should I wait out on uh, you know, should I wait for Graviton three and not move to Graviton two? And you know, the answer there is by default no. That uh, you really start start reaping the benefits of Graviton two now and uh, kind of get on the. Uh, Let's say get on get on the arm train and uh, prepare everything for that because Graviton three and Graviton two are compatible with each other. So uh, so once Graviton three really starts taking off, you can uh, you can easily move there. Yeah, and I think there there is going to be many more instance types with Graviton three just very soon, and yeah, you will be able to to get those benefits uh, uh, there. Uh, yeah, Ulus. Uh, and I guess like a good example of, of uh, Tunis mentioning like, you know, you can definitely start with Graviton 2 without like waiting for it to, to, to come to, to our instance types is the, 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 the last uh, bullet point on, on the GPU type of instance that it has uh, already has like uh, Graviton 2 processor, but still like a big uh, advancement, I think, uh, on this side. So, you know, anybody working on uh, GPU workloads. Uh, I think they're yeah. uh, specifically uh, positioning this to Android Android game streaming, like as a like perfect uh, use case for for this type of instance. So uh, I think you should definitely check it out, especially as you know, all having in mind how much all the GPU instances actually cost. So uh, like getting your your bank for the buck, uh, like better than, than it is now, I think it's definitely something you, you should uh, work uh, worth like looking into. Uh, and I will just briefly mention that, uh, uh, as you probably know, uh, AWS introduced the uh, Mac instances uh, last year. Uh, they were based on the Intel ones, and now uh, AWS presents the M1-based Macs, so they are also ARM-based. So if you would like to develop your applications on uh, 
uh, Macs and I iOS. So these instances are really good development environments for that. So, okay, uh, let's uh, let's move on to the developers uh, stuff. There are quite a few announcements uh, for the developers. Uh, first of all, is the new SDK version. Uh, I, I mean, for uh, several new uh, development languages, uh, new CDK version and CDK Construct Hub, which is basically, as I see, a library of CDK snippets that you can actually use. You don't have to build them the, themselves. What are your thoughts, guys? So I think uh, I think the SDK um, uh, expanding the SDK to to other commonly used languages. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is this could be fairly important to mm -hmm. to developers. Uh, Especially, like let's say, for example, if we take Rust as an example, we we really try to build the SDKs uh, such that they're kind of consistent with your everyday um, experience and your everyday kind of uh, fami the familiar experience that you get from the language and and its libraries and uh, and also also optimize those specifically for. Uh, uh, for those particular environments and the expectations developer might have. So when we talk about Rust, uh, Rust is usually considered a very high performance language. We try mm -hmm. to keep the SDK as well, very high performance uh, and uh, kind of it's engineered to be fast with uh, uh, fast serializers, deserializers, to minimize memory allocations, to reduce CPU utilization, uh, etc. So uh, kind of it, it, these are built to fit into the ecosystem and, uh, and you should definitely try them out if you're, if you're a Swift Kotlin or a, or a Rust developer and let us know your experience. Yeah, and, and, and Thomas, what about that construct hub? Uh, is it right that's like, a like an openly shared, li uh, like openly shared library of uh, CDK pre-built uh, code? It's uh, yeah, almost yeah. It's it's uh, sort of an open source uh, CDK library set, and uh, and really uh, kind of um, a place where you can discover different um, uh, different ways of managing your infrastructure. I, I would say. Uh, so, so far it's been, you know, you have to still search quite a bit. People share their code on GitHub and everything, uh, but kind of the construct hub sort of takes everything into one place, gives you a searchable interface for that. And, uh, and you can get not only kind of AWS, necessarily AWS related things, but for example, uh, you have tools like CDKTF, which is uh, CDK to Terraform, um, let's say compiler. Uh, so that you can build your Terraform scripts in CDK in a in mm -hmm. a in a sort of a, uh, in an imperative language that you're already used to, or or you can build your Kubernetes manifest for, uh, with uh, with CDK, and you get tools for that. Awesome! So many new many new opportunities for our developers to do even more convenient coding on the on the AWS services side. So yeah, good good, good guys, just use that and and have the the, the better better uh, performance on your on your applications. This part is quite unexpected to me because uh, this is the, the well architected framework was very well established framework and didn't change for years. And now AWS comes up on the stage and introduces that to guys. We have to care about the sustainability as much as performance, as much as reliability, security, uh, it's very big step, yeah. What does it mean to our customers? Well, um, I, frankly, uh, it was also like a big surprise to to me to to hear this announcement. A pleasant surprise, I would say. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, we have been working for for some time on um, a sustainability type of uh, audit uh, by ourselves at Cloudwiser because we saw. Uh, the need for that from uh, some of our customers already like coming in, and it's uh, it's great that you know AWS step, stepped in and uh, put on like uh, their own like framework, which is you know like I would call like well architected framework, basically like a bible on uh, not only AWS like on how to build cloud uh, in in the right manner, you know what yeah. you need to do like for security, for availability and stuff like that. So it's great to have sustainability here as a separate topic, which we will uh, definitely 
um, look into very deeply, uh, still waiting for some details uh, from the website as well, part of the well architected program to, to be able to deliver those to, to the customers officially. And, but if you look, you know, what, uh, what it, it says, the announcement, so you would not see like a lot of like new stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, looking at things from another perspective, like things like optimizing your uh, workloads placement from the ge geographic point of view in order to uh, like uh, to use less bandwidth. So mm -hmm. usually we, we were discussing these things, uh, you know, on, uh, on let's say the optimization uh, pillar or, or the cost. But here we look at this, you know, if somebody says, ah, it, it's not, it does not cost a lot, like we don't care, you know, we, we can, you know, let, let's leave it as is. But if we, if uh, we look at, at this from sustainability point of view, like it's one of the ways how you can use uh, less energy, use less resources and be not only sustainable, but also cost efficient and, yeah. and, and optimized as well. So I think uh, it's great we will we'll have this and uh, uh, together with the carbon footprint calculator that was also I think uh, introduced that we will see that in the AWS console. So, you know, those are two very nice things that AWS um, introduced that will help uh, the environment as well, you know, together all the, with all the uh, green energy initiatives they have uh, running uh, quite constantly for the past years. Yeah, and I, I, I think, um... Uh, you know, one thing that echoes in the sustainability pillar as well is is that we uh, we uh, deeply believe in shared responsibility when it comes to when it comes to different aspects. So usually we talk about uh, the shared responsibility in security, but now we're also talking about shared responsibility uh, in sustainability. So uh, sustainability of the cloud is something that we're working with, and will will bring you the. Uh, carbon um, carbon footprint calculator um, to kind of get you some some insights into that as well, um, like what's happening on the background. Uh, there's sustainability in the cloud, which are the things that customers can do to be more sustainable. And now we're also talking a little bit about sustainability uh, through the cloud. Uh, this is briefly mentioned in the pillar, but this is kind of a, a an overarching theme in sustainability where you can use cloud to achieve your bigger sustainability goals. So let's say, for example, if your goal as a company is to save water, uh, you can use different ways, uh, how, different cloud services to that, help yeah. you with it. Yeah, and I think uh, the main, uh, main point, just uh, quite a rough point, but the point to, to take is that the less you pay to AWS, the less you use, the more sustainable you are. Uh, so basically, well, every, every cost that, that uh, our customers uh, have is because AWS has some cost. So be it uh, staffing, be it buildings, be it uh, networking, be it cables or power uh, or cooling or etc. Uh, this all uh, contributes to, to environmental uh, damage. So the less, the, the more sustainability, sustainability, <laughs> more sustainable you can build your architecture uh, i think it's it's best of both worlds you will we will have a better pricing uh, a, a better cost for your applications and you will be also contributing less to the global environment uh, uh, global warming so i think it's yeah. quite a quite a overarching topic as, as a topic on a set yeah, so, yeah. A, a win win situation i would say <laughs> yeah Okay, uh, let's move to the community part. Uh, and we have a, quite a big announcement about the repost, which is basically a glorified uh, AWS users uh, forum, right, Tony? So what is it? Uh, could, you, could you tell us more about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so repost is, um, yeah, let's say, the next, the next level of um, community engagement. Um, it's, a, it's a new site. It's uh, on, uh, at repost.aws. Um, so what we do there is uh, uh, you can, as per usual, like as in a, in a regular forum, maybe, uh, you can ask uh, questions, uh, you can get answers from community members, you can get answers from uh, AWS specialists. Uh, and it's, it's really the sort of a place where to find uh, 
uh, where to find guidance, where to find uh, kind of knowledge, public knowledge, but also knowledge from uh, from inside uh, from inside AWS. We've been working hard to bring one of our uh, internal um, internal tools, which we call answers. Uh, to the wider public and um, kind of curate some of the content that ho- already has been has been answered there uh, to you as well. Uh, but really, it's kind of a providing you maybe a better user experience than forums did, um, and a sort of a single authoritative source of uh, uh, of AWS uh, answers to AWS questions. Um, so yeah, um, something that I'm really, really happy about that we released, and uh, I'm really hoping that there will be more of those uh, community, uh, community engagement uh, options coming, coming, coming along the line. Yeah, so basically a better uh, AWS community experience overall, uh, be it the help from the community itself or the AWS specialists. So that sounds really promising, and I think uh, everyone that from time to time has a question on AWS should take a look there and see whether their question is already answered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you lose anything to add? No, like I'm just, you know, glad to see this uh, coming up and uh, I think the community makes uh, a very, very important part of the, uh, the whole ecosystem yeah. because, uh, you know, especially for the new people, uh, new companies to start using AWS, you know, they will feel way more confident if they will know that like there's a lot of people that are using AWS around them and, and they're able to um, to connect with them and ask questions. So um, I think next to this, you know, we, we could, you know, once again uh, mention that uh, we have uh, also like built like a kind of uh, of a local AWS community on, on the Slack channel that uh, we'll share the link to to join. So if you're not there, uh, please uh, please do. You know, there's also like a, a sort of a, a smaller uh, chunk of AWS uh, fans out there, and also you know sometimes uh, I would say even like our specific local examples or or uh, you know use cases they could uh, go. Give uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good ideas to you. You know how you could do that on your own company and work as well. Yeah, all the links are in the chat. Please check them here, uh, there, and uh, yeah, I think this is a great addition to to the whole AWS experience and 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 great help for the builders as well. Okay, uh, several more uh, uh, developer-related news. Uh, the, the one that I like the most is uh, the newly announced Amazon Dogs Guru for RBS, uh, which basically helps to find those tricky errors or code inefficiencies that just uh, kill your database performance. This is uh, based on machine learning, and it can actually save your DB administrator's time with big time. Like, I, I can't even imagine uh, those, those uh, moments when you just scratch your head or bang your head against the wall because it just doesn't work. And perhaps the machine learning can be better than your DB administrators at some point. <laughs> That's my point of view. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, definitely DevOps guru. I mean, you can you can definitely view view DevOps Guru as a sort of your extension of your team or your your other team member who gives you good advice. I mean, not only for RDS but also what is it, twenty seven other services? Uh, yeah, co coding. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, ML. We see a lot of promise in ML uh, for for those kinds of tasks. Uh, Sometimes there are things that are easy to miss at first, and uh, I think uh, automated reasoning and uh, kind of automated detection of uh, of problems, especially if you have large databases, you have maybe thousands of tables. You don't immediately like there's there's no way you can uh, you can take time to go meticulously over every single thing in your database, and and it's much better to let uh, let an automation do that for you. Right. And, you, and so that you can spend your time delivering value. Yeah, and and on the same point of that uh, automated checking, there's a code guru reviewer secrets detector, which wouldn't let you accidentally leave the secrets, the 
uh, access keys in your code that you deploy or or that you have in your repository. So they will just alarm you that not good guys, <laughs> don't do that. So uh, I think it's like a great safeguard that, that AWS takes uh, takes action on. And yeah, uh, because then we have those problems that, oh God, we have some Bitcoin mining rig <laughs> happening in our account, what to do next? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is like a, a classical uh, example, like in, in all the tra AWS trainings about, you know, if there's like one security issue that, that you know, <laughs> amateurs and beginners have is, is, is yeah, posting your, your, your secrets and uh, credentials uh, together. In a public the so, yeah, yeah, so great to, to have this automated. And I totally agree with uh, Tunis that, that this part of like monitoring and and alerting and, and uh, similar stuff, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential here for, for ML to do because, you know, with the scale of this, like there's no way that a human can do this in an effective manner, uh, like mm -hmm. manually. So you need some kind of help. And, you know, when when you have some data and, you know, when you have that much of like data and experience as say the bus have, so, you know, like getting their experience in, in, a, in a, type of tools like this, you know, that's, that's something very, very useful to a lot of customers. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we should take uh, a bit of respect for machine learning because they are meticulously learners. They learn from uh, years of years of years of experience. They can gather thousand times more experience than even the, more, the most professional guys there. So uh, only thing that they can't actually think that much, but yeah, they're really good helpers. <laughs> oh, okay, let's move on to the some fruity juicy stuff that uh, was actually also a big surprise for us all. Uh, it's a private 5G network that you can order in the console. They will bring it to your location. They will set it up and they will uh, issue even the SIM cards that you have to put in your devices. Uh, amazing, like like futuristic at least. Uh, the applications I see is for um, big uh, manufacturing facilities that have uh, many IoT devices, robots that uh, are communicating via uh, 5G network. Uh, and in order to ask for your <clears throat> provider to provide that 5G coverage in your area, you can actually order it yourself. Is that right, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you if you're if you're looking to establish the sort of a private five G network in a in a public uh, let's say uh, public frequency space, uh, you can you can do that. Uh, the um, yeah, I think it's a it's a good addition to uh, for example the uh, LoRaWAN connectivity on on IoT that we saw uh, last year. Uh, which uh, you know enables your IoT devices to connect over uh, over an efficient uh, efficient network and over a mm -hmm. large a large area. So now you can do the same with five G and get really these high bandwidth uh, connections up there as well. VR, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, definitely really good use cases there as well, uh, so that you can deliver your uh, your uh, AR VR experience uh, through five G directly without having to plug into well, without having to drag a cable uh, along, essentially. Yes, so basically for high throughput, low latency applications, right? So yes. that's what 5G promises. And yeah, and for the IoT devices, yeah, as you mentioned, there are uh, perhaps more efficient ways to, to deliver the data to them. But this, but this thing is for, for specific applications that have to have low latency, at least. Yeah. Julius, what do you think? <laughs> well... I was lost, uh, lost for words when, when I yeah, heard this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had no idea that uh, I need like this actually existed. <laughs> but then, yeah, once uh, I think about it, once I read uh, the public announcements and said that, yeah, like, yeah, somebody might need this. You know, it's, it's, it's another example, like another add to the whole menu of AWS services that shows, you know, how broad can you go with AWS, you know, I, I, I would like put this service like in, in the same, uh, 
uh, on the same shelf with like uh, AWS Ground Station, you know, which provides you satellite, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, as a service, quantum computing, RoboMaker, like all of that stuff that you would think that like who would use that? But you know, even like uh, like for RoboMaker, we already like uh, have a few customers using that uh, on their robots, uh, yeah. you know, to train them. Uh, um, it, just in the Baltics, so you know, all across across the world, with the scale that AWS has, I'm sure that um, that there will be uh, customers using this. And you know, the private five G. When you hear about this, most probably, you know, if I would be a big uh, uh, IoT user uh, somewhere, like mostly like offsite of uh, the current grid, you know, why not? Areas, it sounds yeah. very reasonable. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool, cool stuff, heck, indeed. So, uh, do we have any uh, information about the coverage? Uh, which areas do they cover? Stay only can, United can States we have it to, or yeah, in, in Europe? Uh, it's currently currently in uh, in preview, and we're we're onboarding just a limited number of customers. But uh, you know, if if anyone's interested, uh, let's uh, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, connect with your uh, AWS account manager or, uh, uh, yeah, let us know. Uh, Cloud, yeah, you can always, like, uh, if you don't have any AWS account manager, so Cloudwares is here to, 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 to be the, you know, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be the middle we'll guy. Actually, <laughs> I, I would be very interested in, like, participating in that kind of discussion. Uh, uh, because I remember when Graham Station came up, and, yeah, we had, like, one satellite company here in Lithuania that, uh, uh was the need to, that discussion like we learned a lot just doing like the whole uh preview stage because yeah those are very niche products but but uh, very interesting for sure yeah cool so that's that from our side uh perhaps guys do do you do, do you have anything else from the from your head to to just something that's stuck in your head like like any any of the news, because uh, mm. one thing one thing that was uh, uh, introduced uh, before reInvent uh, was the outposts and the not the outpost racks but outpost servers, and I think that's a really great addition to the outpost uh, family, because now you don't have to buy and ship a whole rack; you can buy a ship a to you server. To your location and have the AWS extension right at your premises, so it's suitable for branches, uh, offices, uh, and stuff like uh, and similar stuff. So, uh, to me, that was quite uh, fascinating, although expected, because uh, not everybody need a whole rack of <laughs> server equipment to run their workloads. But yeah, this is a, a great uh, approach to to the problem that our customers have, yeah, and and who wants to use uh, AWS in their locations. Yeah, yeah, precisely, and I, I and it's uh, yeah uh, retail retail customers who might want to have their like some compute some piece of AWS in the branches uh, telecommunications customers maybe you want to put your put some compute next to next to your uh, uh, stations uh, kind of transmitters uh, yeah. these are all kind of valuable valuable use cases. Uh, for me, uh, for me, the, one of the things that we didn't mention uh, were the CloudWatch, uh, CloudWatch uh, updates. So CloudWatch RAM and CloudWatch mm -hmm. evidently. Uh, definitely look at uh, look at those as well. So when we talked about feature flags, uh, uh, this was more in the context of app configuration. But uh, CloudWatch evidently also gives you exper experiments experiment support. So. Uh, you can uh, you can design your own um, let's say uh, feature release experiments. How you can uh, let's uh, design different ways how you push certain changes out to your customers and measure how efficient or how effective those changes are. Like whether whether they're well accepted or not well accepted. And if you're if you're doing uh, uh, development work and and feature work at any reasonable scale then you want to run those experiments and you want to validate your your hypothesis and with with data um, and uh, ram also gives you some visibility into um, into how well your front end uh, applications are well your kind of the last mile of your application delivery works and and ability to monitor that so definitely check those out if 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 those are of interest to you mm. uh, by the way guys it's your time to shine 
uh, it's Q&A time. So feel free to submit your questions and we'll be here to answer them. Uh, unless you lose, you have something stuck in your head, we can proceed to the question. Uh, I have like one uh, one thing that, that, that we did not cover, but uh, it seemed kind of interesting to me and uh, I'm, I'm planning to look uh, deeper into it and maybe talk with, with some of our current customers. It's the Amazon FinSpace, like the data management and analytics service built, uh, like purpose built for financial service uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I know, like at least like uh, in, in our region, like nine out of, out of 10 fintech companies, they run on AWS. And uh, it's definitely like AWS is very huge in, in, in that area. So uh, I think like having this kind of like purpose built uh, service that has like uh, uh, pre built data preparation functions and some machine learning models, you know, taken straight from the industry. And, and we have like this as, as like drafts and templates uh, to use uh, for your own data and workloads, like uh, seems pretty promising. Uh, I would like to see that like in action with some uh, real use cases, but. Uh, Overall, I think that's something that uh, uh, all the fintech uh, companies should uh, at least take a deeper look into uh, from their side. Yeah, yeah, that's also interesting addition to to the whole breadth of the AWS uh, offerings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once again, I'm I'm not like uh, Tunis. Do you like know the number right now? Like, what's what's the amount of uh, services that AWS uh, offers? Because I remember <laughs> that last year we. Stepped over 200, uh, 237, something like that. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we don't. Uh, let's let, let's put it this way: we we almost lost <laughs> counting, but uh, but yeah, over over two. The number is over 200 at the moment, um, for sure. Yeah, mind blowing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we 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 have a question from Eowyn, uh, who had to leave uh, earlier. Uh, but he or, or she, I don't, I, I'm not sure, uh, asked us to, to share which uh, presentations should they watch from the reInvent, because there are so many of them, which are the most valuable? Uh, I would just bluntly offer these, Adam Slepsky, uh, like the main presentation covering uh, all the main uh, and most interesting additions to the to the, uh, to the AWS over the year uh, and the perhaps the database focused uh, database focused uh, presentation as well. Uh, what are your favorites? I, 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 I have like one of my own like if we like take all the keynotes you know to the side because yeah all of them are worth uh, looking into for sure. So uh, I guess uh, I just don't remember like the naming right now, but there was like one uh, uh, leadership session on Kubernetes and the use cases, which really like stuck uh, uh, for, uh, for me. And uh, like, as I know that Aeon is uh, definitely on our community Slack channel. So oh. if uh, he will, be, will have any trouble finding it, so just, you know, ping me and I will uh, share the link. I will find it somewhere. Like definitely worth uh, like uh, a look because it's uh, quite deep, but at the same time, quite broad on the, you know, the use cases that, that you could go for Kubernetes. And I liked, liked a lot, like, you know, how, like what's, what's even like the show, even like part of the uh, roadmap that AWS has uh, on uh, like, uh, you know, how in the future they see like Kubernetes uh, being run on, on AWS and you know in in all of those different services like Fargate, EKS, ECS, and so on. Yeah, that's was interesting to me as well. <laughs> yeah, and I would I would I would echo echo the uh, the uh, uh, idea of watching leadership sessions. Like leadership sessions, uh, they sort of uh, I think do a really good work on on. Um, Kind of squashing and kind of collapsing all of all of the right. uh, all of the important stuff and uh, together into 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 one session. So, yeah, uh, yeah anything uh, for for me, anything infrastructure related has always been interesting. But uh, you know, for to everyone their own. Uh, but leadership sessions, they they do a good good, I think, really good work at uh, 
giving you the best best bang of the, for for the buck. They're like graviton too, but for yeah, <laughs> best best use of your time. <laughs> <laughs> and I see Karina shared in a chat that uh, a link to the top announcement. So feel free to to take a look there. Uh, okay. Uh, next we have a uh, uh, question from the anonymous attendee, uh, and he has. His question is that we start with just starting out on AWS and which of these announcements should be the most important to a startup at that stage? Well, I think it's, it's the, the answer would be the same. Uh, first, take the leadership sessions. They are like, they help you to, to have an idea where the AWS is, is going, what's the path, uh, what, what can you, what crazy things you can expect from it. <laughs> and then also, uh, take a look at your uh, workload at your application and get some specific uh, specific sessions for for those um, for those areas Jonas, yes. don't you think that uh, the question was more about like specific services from that that you know that we went through like which ones um, ah, should be applicable should be to, to a startup which um, of these announcements right perhaps yeah okay you yeah. please well, like, you know, my first, uh, the first thing that came into my mind was definitely like the serverless stuff. Of course, if you have like, if your startup uh, has or will have like a lot of data uh, coming in and you have some plans. So definitely like anything related to serverless is, uh, is a great uh, starting point for, for a startup, which, you know, then it's great for experimenting. It's uh, low cost, easy to use. Easy to start. Um, yeah, yeah, you do not need to, you know, be a, a super, uh, like, uh, AWS Monster group. building expert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that, that, that what uh, came into my mind. But I don't know, Tunis, maybe you have some, some other ideas. In in general, anything that uh, that helps with your velocity, serverless is a is a great example. I also think that uh, those observability uh, observability um, um, things like CloudWatch, evidently CloudWatch uh, RAM as well, to just verify that whatever product you're building, if it is a customer facing product, uh, that it works as you expect and that you're getting the value. Uh, value delivered to your customers. So these are definitely if you're a uh, uh, if you're looking more towards um, mm, uh, towards machine learning, uh, then there's a whole number of announcements that we didn't cover in the SageMaker space. Uh, so uh, these these might be of interest to you as well. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would I would say anything anything that helps you move faster. Yeah, and build on ARM, I guess. If you're planning to to have your workloads on EC2 or on 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 containers, yeah, just just go that way, and uh, it will save big in in the long term. So yeah, and also start you know start with managed services. That that might be uh, uh, the first uh, advice. Yeah, the, the first uh, sort of advice, like when we when we think about uh, uh, if if you want to quickly get something out there to your customers and and later you can later optimize yeah yeah cool and the next question is uh, asking uh, whether we have uh, visited reinvent physically uh, and so and if so how was it <laughs> I, I i guess uh, as, as uh, stone said that he has uh, a reinvent uh, t-shirt or something like that so my guess is that that uh, tonis is the only one uh, from from uh, from us who has been there. Uh, no, unfortunately, unfortunately, I haven't had the pleasure to be at at reInvent myself. Uh, it's uh, you know we we kind of focus that that conference to towards our customers, right? And uh, uh, you know only 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 those who who really have customer engagements or really have sessions there usually go. Uh, we have similar events internally, but uh, but uh, uh, what I what I hear at least from my colleagues who have been there, um, it's uh, you know the feeling the feeling is um, is uh, can be pretty overwhelming. Let's let's put it this way, <laughs> especially especially when we're talking about uh, uh, reinvents of the past. I I haven't heard much back from. Uh, from this year's reinvent because you know because of the situation that we're in uh, i think it was slightly at a lower scale in terms of crowds and mm -hmm. and activities and it was sort of hybrid hybrid mode uh, but i can imagine that uh, that the um, uh, reinvents before 2020 were uh, pretty wild 
tens of thousands participants. Yeah, like I think uh, the last year before before the COVID came, uh, it was seventy thousand people like, officially. So, Crazy. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's worth uh, going there just to see, you know, how uh, how do they cope with with, with all of that. And I uh, listened to a podcast with uh, like a person that who's responsible for organizing all of it, like the, the main uh, person behind it. So as I understand, so like uh, on the first week of January, they start preparing for the next year's stream event. So like basically. Until the summer, they, like a lot of the details have already been fought through, and then you know you, you go to execution. So that's you know just imagine how huge it is. But uh, I was uh, uh, I I have not been uh, to AWS uh, per- personally myself as well. Though this year uh, I had a plan to do that, but uh, as uh, the situation with uh, you know allowing people to come to the United States from Europe uh, has been changing a lot and. At uh, some point, I just, you know, simply said uh, whatever. So, uh, you know, hopefully next year next we'll time. do that. Because I think, you know, uh, in terms of content, at least I personally think that uh, I would most probably, you know, be able to see more things than, than uh, if I would, you know, just watch it online at my own pace. But in terms of, like, the inspiration, uh, the whole spirit and, you know, being around a lot of people that are hyped about the same things yeah. that you are, I think you know there's there's no other way you cannot you can never have that uh, uh, online and you know the only way to to feel that is just you know um, grab your things and then go there and you know Vegas is definitely not a bad place to visit uh, <laughs> <laughs> next to the to the all that was announced. So yeah, so it it might be the single better thing than AWS repos is uh, a reinvent, right? <laughs> the better experience of the community. <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, sadly, we are out of time. Uh, thanks for all the all the attendees. Thanks, Tunis and Yudas for, for helping me to cover the all the all the hottest news from reinvent and more. Uh, yeah. I th- thanks for your questions. Uh, if, if you have any more questions, please uh, address them to us. Uh, you can find us in, your, in our Slack channel. Uh, we will also share the recording with you guys uh, tomorrow. So yeah, I think that's that. Uh, thanks, thanks again, guys, and uh, have a good one. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure.